morning. Right. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And we know the Lord is here with us. Let me open it for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this glorious day. And thank you, Lord, for the blessings you've given us. I pray, Lord, you will uh, give us this sermon through our pastor so that we may learn something, that we may hear it, and, and take it, put it to work. I pray, Lord, that you will keep this virus away from us and continue to bless us, Lord. And I ask these things in your name, Heavenly Father. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad that you're all here today. Let's take a moment looking at some announcements and different things that are going on in the church. First of all, let me say Happy Father's Day to all of the dads. It is a great day in order to spend folks in a little bit on what dads do to contribute, but also just recognizing and thanking them in a non pie kind of way. I can't tell you. How much it humors me that everybody really thinks of this church and Father's Day as pies and Mother's Day as breakfast. Well, there's a good chance that one day it will be again, but for this week, uh, we'll go ahead and operate without pie. But happy Father's Day all the same. We do have new email addresses here at the church. The pastor's email address is pastor at fbcfm.church. If you're one of those people that needs to contact Karen every now and again, it is secretary at fbcfm.church. The reason for changing the internet provider after 20 some odd years is so that with, uh, if everything goes exactly right, I, I, I can't really even guarantee this will work, but we believe it will, that in the next few weeks we'll be able to live stream from this room and people at home will be able to watch it successfully. Every week I've gotten comments from folks and they'll say, well, the picture was blurry, the camera was out of focus, the sound, the microphone didn't work. It really isn't any of those things. It's the bandwidth. There's no internet signal in here. So even today, Candace gave it a brave try, but really, people at home are not able to watch me right now, or if they are, it's very intermittent how much they can see. Consequently, uh, we are switching on Tuesday to a new internet provider, and assuming that works, we're going to buy what's going to prove to be a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment, Maybe a lot more, I'm not sure, but that will allow us then to run internet to other rooms. And once we have a full signal in here, we should be able to live stream. Uh, coronavirus, remember all the safety measures. I'm tired of talking about it, so I'm moving on. Partially also, I'm hurrying because we have a lot to do today. There are things starting back next Sunday. We're going to move the children for the Bible study. You know, we started Bible study this morning. So we had Bible study in this room for adults this morning. And the children stayed with us today. Next Sunday, we're going to move the children to the sanctuary. The adults will still be in here for Bible study. And also next Sunday night, we will have uh, uh, Sunday evening service. And I believe that will be in here. You know, I no, it won't be in here. That will be in sanctuary. Sanctuary. I forget sometimes all the plans. Everything changes and my brain still used to old system. Team meetings, women's team meeting will meet today after service. Drama team will meet next Sunday at 9 a.m. And the uh, finance team will meet next Sunday after service. And the Jubilee practice will meet next Sunday. Here in this room, they'll meet at 4 o'clock and should be clear before youth group. All right, it is time to sing together. Before we do that, though, let I've been adding extra prayers in the services because we're going through a unique time as a people. I thoroughly believe, thoroughly believe God is up to something in our age. He is wanting to accomplish something. He wants that to be through his people. We need to be ready. We need to be ready to get out there. We need to be able to tell people about the hopes that we have. But in order to do that, we have to move past our own fears and our own concerns and some of those things. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this day in which we celebrate dads, and as 
dads lead out in numerous ways in the family, we ask you to continue to bless them and encourage them, even the dads that are in this room today. As we look at the day in which we lead, help us to be sharp, help us to be uh, alert, help us to be aware of the circumstances in which we live, and help us to see your guidance in this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's sing together. Let's all stand together as we sing, I will sing of my Redeemer.
Jesus made a man of me with your integrity, a man of the spirit, a man of the Lord, a servant of the Lord, and all. Charles Short, as most of you know, and welcome to First Baptist Church, Fort Mojave. We're glad to have all of you here today. This is the point in the service where we welcome first-time visitors. If this is your first time, and if you would like to bring greetings, you can slip your hand up, tell me who you are and where you're from. Now, if you're not comfortable doing that, my best advice is don't put your hand up. You don't have to introduce yourself, but if you'd like to, you can. Would anyone like to introduce themselves today? All right, let's go ahead and keep pressing on then. We do have quite a few things to do today, so let me call uh, Ralph if he'll come forward. I think Missionary Moments is next. I'm hoping it is. There it is. Once again, good morning. And we have so much to be thankful for and, and to give praise for to our Lord and Savior. But this is about the missionaries of the world. And I think Kay, my wife, has been a missionary for a long time. She's been with me for 56 years as of Friday. So wish her a happy anniversary. I know she loves being called into the spotlight. Uh, this, uh, we're going to talk about this morning, a couple down in New Orleans, Noah and Tara Madden. Now this is two people, two missionaries, that are truly blessed already. Uh, Noah is working on a Master of Divinity degree, Tara a Master's degree in Counseling, uh, well equipped for a lifetime of ministry, and we're supporting them because our church supports New Orleans Seminary through our cooperative program. It, it lowers the cost for the students to go to, to school, and there is 18,000 students in our six Southern Baptist seminaries. 
and that's probably more students than all the other Christian seminars in the USA combined. But there's more to this. As they study, Noah and Taryn are already helping plant a new church in New Orleans by discipling young adults coming to faith in Christ. After they graduate, they're going to move to uh, Boston. I don't know why you'd want to move from New Orleans to Boston. Uh, anyways, that's where God's sending them. Uh, and they're going to serve as missionaries with the North American Mission Board. They'll plant a church to help reach about 6 million mostly lost people. And we'll su continue to support them in our ministry, our cooperative program. So let's ask God to bless their studies and their ministry, and let's pray for our New Orleans Seminary. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for uh, this two people that are going to carry on and, and press forward to share your word, and they're at a wonderful place to do that, as, as you already know. But uh, New Orleans is a, a wonderful jumping off spot for them. And Lord, I pray you just use these people uh, and let them spread your word, and that we will continue to uh, give and that uh, we may support them, Lord. I ask this in your name. Amen.
let's all stand together now as we sing Take the Name of Jesus with You. And at the end of the song, we'll have the gentleman come for the offering. to your work as people faithfully give. We are encouraged by their faithfulness and we know that you work through us and every time that we obey. Bless this offering, use it uh, in your kingdom's work and direct us to do according to your will with it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated.
gentlemen, stack those all up all the way on that end of the table for me. All right, it's time for our children's sermon today. For our children's sermon, we're going to be thinking about Father's Day. Most directly that we're going to address it today, perhaps, will be during the children's sermon. I would like two children that are willing to compete against each other a little bit to come here to the front. One of you stand over here and one of you stand over there. They'll probably have to be siblings and that's okay. Go ahead, come on up. Uh, there we go, Blake and Alyssa. Now the contest I'm about to give you is very hard, all right? I was just reading her shirt. It says, I'm not bossy, I have leadership skills. <laughs> all right, you have a nail in a holder, all right? So your challenge is, I'm just going to give you a bunch, okay? Your challenge is to balance as many, that one's bent, we're not going to use it, to use as many nails as you can and balance them on top of the nail that's sticking up from the holder. Go ahead, start. Balance as many as you can on top of the nail. No, you can't stick it in. You've got to be on top of the nail. Balance it on top of the nail and put as many as you can on top of the nail. You don't seem to be making a lot of progress. Do you have any other ideas? Was this challenge too hard? No? Okay, try harder then. I want you to get at least three up there, okay? Three. At least three. All right, you're not making it? All right, let's do this then. We'll turn it into a contest between me and your dad. So you guys go get seated, and we'll have Michael come up. Michael, how many nails can you balance on top of a nail head? One. You think one? Yes. Okay. So watch this. Put one down. Put one across. Then start putting the others every other. Okay? And don't drop them. Every other going across it like this. All right, you got that part? Yeah. How many do you got on there? You have to have someone take the count. Okay, let's take off the last two. All right, now, you want to take a single nail and set it across. This one needs to be back a little bit more, maybe there. You need to set it across there like that. Now, I'm going to tell you the trick here. You have to be calm and not nervous because everyone's watching. And you have to be steady-handed. And if you're all of those things, then you can pick up the bottom nail, hold it just by the bottom nail, pick it up very slowly, and then move it over. My hands are shaking too bad. My hands are... <laughs> now it's shaking. Michael did it. I did not. So Michael balanced nine nails. I don't know why when you put ten on there, one always falls out. I don't know why it works every time, but one falls out. He balanced nine nails on the head of a nail. 
Now, Michael, I want to ask you a question. How did you know to do that? What do you mean directions? You, you, you paid attention to my directions? Wow, there's a first time for everything. You know, the funny thing is, I must not have printed off my instructions because I don't see them here. But I already know that the verse I want to point to is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So I'm going to find it real fast. I usually have it printed off. 2 Timothy, you can go ahead and be seated, by the way. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Michael, I have a feeling that before the day's out, you're going to end up teaching some kids how to balance nails on top of a nail, on top of a nail's head. But as dads, we're constantly training our children. We're training those that are watching. We're training them how to do things that they don't know how to do yet. We're training one another how to live out the Christian life. On Wednesday night, we have Bible studies here at church. The women meet in the sanctuary. The men are meeting in this room, although we've been negotiating and talking about going to a smaller room. We're going to be studying the book of Revelation. We've gotten one Bible study in so far in the book of Revelation. It is men training men, people training people, so that we can all learn how to do this walk with God thing. So that's what the children's message was today. Isn't it clever how that gets on there? <laughs> it was clever a moment ago. Now we got several nails down there for Becky to step on. I probably better pick those up, huh? All right, we'll hide those down there. Let's just pray for the kids for a minute. Father, thank you for the opportunity to have children in church. And we do ask that you would help us as a church to train them up, to help them to grow in Christ, to help them to become Christian men, as we just sang about, help them to be Christian people, as we always say, that will serve you, stick with you, follow you, obey you. Help us continue to train one another to be godly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we have started a sermon series through the Gospel of John. I seriously consider taking a break from the sermon series in order to talk about some Father's Day topic, but I felt like the topic that's in the next scripture passage was a good Father's Day topic. Although I'm not going to aim it just at men, I believe that the men in the room may well need to hear this particular message more than others. Now, the message is shaped on uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And in this, in this passage, it's often described as Jesus' first miracle. Let me read it to you. I'll put it on the screen behind me as I do. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he served poorer wine but you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did 
in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So the tell to that passage tells us one of the main reasons why this occurred was so that his disciples, those people walking with him, would recognize that he wasn't just an ordinary person. Now as we look at this passage, we're going to be thinking about transformation. But now as we look at this passage, we have to be very careful, and that is to not get distracted about the wrong things. This is just one of those passages that we can get ourselves asking all kinds of questions. We may want to know, was the wine that Jesus made alcoholic? I have very good reasons from the Greek language to think it wasn't, but whether it was or wasn't is a distraction. It's not the point of what Jesus did there. We might wonder why he talked to his mom the way he talked to his mom. He says, woman, what has that got to do with us? When I was growing up, there was times that me and my mom were in conflict. I never once looked her in the face and said, woman, not once. Now, the main reason why is because both my brothers had done it, and it didn't go so well for them. So I didn't do it because I had seen what the outcome would be. We have a life full of distractions, and in a sense, we have a passage full of distractions. And I just let me apply this for a second. We need to be very careful in our lives not to get so distracted by the normal everyday bills, by the things going on in the world, by the different tensions that we feel, by our disappointments, that we forget that we can become very intentional, we can choose the life that we live in Jesus Christ. We can choose transformation. But the number one enemy to transformation for all of us is distraction, that we get caught up on some of the wrong things. But if a person is at a point where they really recognize what it is they need, that they need their life to change, they're unhappy with things as they are, and they want to see real genuine change in their lives, then we can choose transformation. And the final step to that, though, is we also have to be willing to accept it. To be willing to accept transformation means a whole lot of things. It means you got to admit that what you're doing right now isn't working, that the path you're on is not working out all right, that your wisdom that got you where you are needs to be abandoned, and that God's wisdom, which provides salvation and opportunity, needs to be accepted. So if those are going to be essentially our three steps in this sermon, uh, let's begin looking at them and let's begin moving through them. All of this from... John chapter 2, but not getting into all the other little details. I've heard pe that people preach this passage talking about the number of pots is the most significant thing and, and just a lot of things. Right now, I think the most significant thing is water became wine. The transformation is the most significant thing. So let's talk about that water for just a minute. I'm sure that you are aware that water is necessary for life. I have to be very careful. I have a tendency to always have a big cup on my desk and it's full of tea or water and I drink that all day long. But there are many days, and I did this a couple of times this past week, where I am so focused on some other things that need to get done or I'm so distracted by life, I forget to drink water. When you don't allow water to take care of you, your health declines, you're more likely to catch colds, you're more likely to have uh, disorientation, not thinking clearly. There's a whole lot of things that come about. Let's just summarize it by saying that water is necessary for life. This particular water that was in these large pitchers and setting around the entrance to the dining hall or wherever they were, it was there for what they called a ritual of purification. As people would come into the room, they went through these steps uh, where it's a fancy way of washing their hands, fancy way of washing up in some other ways too, but essentially they're cleaning up. Essentially they're trying to use this water in order to clean up their lives and to become better with it. Well, that's something that water can do for you. I don't know about you this morning, but when I stepped into the shower, what I turned on was water. I, I didn't bathe in motor oil. I'm guessing none of you did either. We use water as a cleansing factor in our world, and that's a part of who we are. 
water for cleaning ourselves up. This was water that was set aside for, uh, for helping uh, the people there have clean hands. And also it was water in a ritual and a symbol to help them feel like they were cleansed and purified before God. You know, if we're willing to accept it, Jesus gives this water of life. We haven't gotten to this passage yet, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to be in John, the fourth chapter. Jesus is going to be talking to uh, the woman at the well, and as he talks with her, he's going to describe a water that he gives, a water which is a synonym for salvation, essentially, or a symbol, I should say, for salvation, that he's willing to give them this water of life, water that springs up inside of them for eternal life. Well, let me say that the beginning of transformation is to recognize that we need a change from where we're at in order to allow Christ to forgive our sins and then to begin to leave those sins behind, rule over our day-to-day, moment-to-moment lives. You see, whether you recognize it or not, sin chases you down. When you empower it, it chases you. It keeps coming after you. It it wants to hunt you down, and many times, depending on exactly what the sin is, it's going to try to kill you. Uh, I mentioned in the Bible study today that when I was in high school, I did an abundant amount of drinking alcohol. Now, I don't encourage anybody to drink alcohol. Part of the reason why, and part of the reason I quit drinking alcohol was that I noticed and looked around and saw how many of my friends were dying. For a smallish school, not a huge school, it is amazing how many of my friends died in drunk driving accidents even before they were 25. When I went back to my 10-year reunion, which based on that experience, it's the only reunion I've ever gone to. I didn't go to the 20 or to the 30. I'm just waiting to see if anyone asks if I've been to the 40 or not, but the answer is no. All of those different reunions, they I didn't go to them because that first one, I looked around and saw, you know, an awful lot of the people I want to see, I, I, if I'm going to see them, I'm going to have to go visit them in the graveyard. It was kind of funny, especially when I called a good friend I had right before the reunion and said, hey, are you going to go? And they said, basically, no, we're not going to go. Walter Johnson won't be there. Why won't Walter be there? Well, he's down at the graveyard. He died drinking one day alone at home. I never knew that Walter was a diabetic. Well, what do you know? So, Jesus gives water of life to help us to leave behind those habits, those problems, those struggles that are going to harm us. He gives us salvation. He gives us forgiveness of sin. He gives us new patterns so that we can be transformed. But if water was for life, Jesus is at a wedding, a celebration, and he takes regular water and he turns it into wine. And I'm going to say that wine is for celebration. Now be careful how you hear me. I am not endorsing the use of alcohol and I don't want anyone drinking alcohol. And I want you to understand that in Scripture, there's one word because they didn't have any way to pasteurize grape juice and keep it from fermenting. So there's one word for grape juice. We translate that wine. When he made the better wine, it was probably new wine. It was probably grape juice, not alcoholic. I'm not encouraging you to drink wine, but I am encouraging you to recognize that the life you really want to live is going to have a celebrative element to it. It is pretty easy to get distracted by the struggles of life, the different things that are going on in life, but what we want is for life to have something in it that is worth celebrating. Numerous people today have said to me, so who makes you a pie today? Who's going to make a pie for you? Why do they say that? Well, because we've always celebrated Father's Day with pies. That's what we do as a church. We're not doing it today because of COVID-19. But if you think about it, we as a church and you as a family and just humanity in general, we celebrate around food. We celebrate around the table. We have big pitchers of sweet tea and and, and roast meat. And I started to say something else. I have no idea what I was going to say. Roast vegetables. Anyway, so we celebrate around food. Wine, in this case, was what they were going to be celebrating 
there at the at, at the wedding. Not only that, those of us that I'm losing place in my notes, sorry. It happens every now and again. Those of us that have lived any length of time, we recognize that, that celebrations are what really make life worth living. We need to have something to have joy in. We need to have opportunities that we just relax and enjoy and celebrate one another. I bring that up in that way, or I'm trying to bring it up in a certain way. Here's what I want you to hear me say. There's something missing in the Christian life when you aim at giving your sins to Jesus Christ, giving your heart to Jesus Christ, and then you look at Christian existence as a drab, dreary, miserable experience from then on out. <laughs> you are missing something. Christianity should be about joy and celebration and time together and the relationships that we have together. I don't know if you've ever caught on to this, but celebration is an expression of relationship. Anybody who says that they are going to go someplace and celebrate alone is lying to themselves. Celebrations are always about your relationship, your joy of being around, your friendships with other people, and the connections that you have with one another. Celebrates are exercises in relation, celebrations are exercises in relationships. We need to recognize that about celebrations and here's something else we need to know that because life is distracting because life chases us from point to point we need to know how important it is to be intentional about planning celebrations one of the reasons why we have announcements in our worship services you remember a while ago I was telling you all the things that are going on in a normal time frame that, sh that page and all those different announcements would be full up with different things where people are going to get together, they're going to laugh together, they're going to eat together, they're going to drink tea together, and they might even have some ice cream thrown in there somewhere. They're going to celebrate together. Now the truth of the matter is you can celebrate without food and drink. But most of the time we like to do it with food and drink. However you're going to do it, though, it takes some intentionality. It takes a decision to make it happen. It takes a, a willingness to say, okay, i got to quit being distracted by the rigors of life, and I have to set aside some time, I have to set aside some resources, I have to set aside uh, some energy in order to celebrate. Let me ask you a question. Do you see worship as a celebration? For some people, the answer to that is a very quick, oh yeah, absolutely. For some other people, it's, well, let me think about that. Well, let me encourage you to shift worship in your mind. If it's sitting there as an obligation, move off of obligation and move to celebration. If it's sitting there as a, as a duty or responsibility, let me encourage you to move it off of that and move it to a celebration. We need to know how to celebrate together. We need to know how to rejoice with one another. We need to know how to be grateful and excited about all that Christ is doing amongst us. So we've talked about water and we've talked about wine. But let's take a minute and talk about let's take a minute and also talk about blood. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ was for transformation. Water is necessary for life. Water's for life. And water helps us to recognize our need for eternal life in Jesus Christ. Wine is for celebration, our opportunities to be together and to enjoy our times together. But the blood of Jesus Christ, it's what allows all of this other stuff to take place. You're probably aware that the wine that we're discussing, whether it's merely grape juice or whether it's actually fermented, it's a symbol that points to the blood of Christ when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. It helps us to see what Jesus did for us. It helps us to remember that he poured out his blood for us as proof of his divine love. You know, one of the things I want to awaken you today, just one of the things I want to awaken you today is an ability to see that you want some things to change in your life. 
part of what most of us have already seen as change, but all of us need to see as change is we need to know how much God loves us. God loves us so much He was willing to go to the cross in our place that where we have done things that are wrong, where we have done things that are abhorrent, He wants to just pay that price for us so that we can move on, we can celebrate, we can rejoice, we can be with Him in eternity because He was willing to allow His love to be poured out for us as the sacrifice to cover our sins. Once our sins are covered, then we can live in right relationship with Him, and in some ways, just almost as important, we can live in right relationship with ourselves and with one another. So the water represented life, the wine represented celebration, but the blood for today, let's let it celebrate transformation. And in the blood of Jesus Christ, humanity has been given an invitation an opportunity to come to Jesus Christ to recognize that He can change us, that He can make life better, that He can give us a life filled with purpose and meaning and, and who we're really meant to be in Him. But here's the deal. It's an invitation. It's not a mandate. It's an invitation that's put in front of you and you have to choose whether or not you want to receive that invitation. As we get ready to wrap up today, we're going to have just a moment of decision and perhaps there's somebody in the room today that needs to receive the gift of salvation offered in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs to receive some other form of trans transformation in their lives as they seek to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. If you're here and you're struggling and your heart is hurting and, and you know you need change, here's what we're going to do. In just half a second, I'll have everybody stand up and then I'll voice a word of prayer for all of us. When I'm done with that prayer, a lot of people are going to sing an invitation hymn. But listen, if you know you need to make a decision, you know you need to see your life change, don't get distracted by a song. Come forward, talk with me, and let me help you if you've never given your life to Christ, turn your life over to Jesus Christ. If you have a particular point of sin that you're wrestling with, let me pray for you to overcome that sin. Let me help you in whatever way it is that God wants to bring about transformation in your life today. Let's stand together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the transformation available in the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, help us not settle just for the water of life. Help us not settle just for everyday celebration. But help us to strive for the eternal and what we were called for, which is a relationship with you in Jesus Christ. If anybody here needs to give their heart to Jesus Christ, give them the courage to step up today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
said earlier that we actually have several more things to do today. Let me ask all of you to be seated, and I'm going to move on to at least two more things. Uh, while you are seated, let me invite the Stivers, if they would come forward and be right up here on front. And because they may be here a while, I'm going to bring them chairs. That would be why it's not coming through. We have a pattern in our church that we will try our very best, not just to bless people as they come to our church, but also to bless them as they leave. We, we don't really like anyone to leave, and I've been telling people for years, you have to fill out a form in triplicate, you have to get permission, and you have to send two replacements. I don't know why most people don't really do that, uh, but this is Mike and Shirley Stiver's last Sunday with us. Now, in the past, we have had people gather around them, lay their hands on them, pray for them, and, and we're not going to do that today because uh, we, don't want to, uh, we don't want to share with them. I guess that's the way to put it. But I am going to call on several people in order to pray for them, uh, every single one of which doesn't know I'm about to call on them. But it is fair. If you want to say no, you're allowed to say no. But, uh, um, Becky, would you like to pray for them before they go? Use your microphone, please. And, Ralph, would you like to pray for them? I need you to come here so it doesn't echo through the microphones. You can come around here and use this microphone to pray for them. Uh, Craig, did you want to pray for them today also? Can you share that microphone with Craig when you're done? And when that is done, I still have one more thing I'd like to do after that. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for uh, Mike and Shirley and what they brought to us when they came. We will miss them very much, Father, but we're asking that you put your hand of protection on them, give them safe journey, and lead them to a church where they can serve again. And we ask that you would just go with them and keep them healthy. And thank you again that you've given them to us for this time. In Jesus' name. Father, Hello. There, yeah, that's better. Heavenly Father, we uh, received these two people from a foreign land. And we've done our best to civilize them. And now we send them on their way, Lord and they go to spread your word, and we love these people, and ask that you continue to bless them, Lord. And if you change your mind about keeping them, send them back to us. We will welcome them back. Amen. Lord Jesus, it, it's a pleasure to have been able to serve with Mike and Shirley. It's a pleasure to have known that their joy is, is you. Nothing else. Their joy is you. They follow that first and brings a joyful life and everything else that they do. And at this time, there is joy in their movement. There is joy in the new adventure. There is apprehension. But there is definitely joy. Joy to go to a place that they can serve you and, and clearly understand the direction that you have for them. That's all we all ask for is a purpose. And you have given us that purpose, Lord, and now they follow it. Lord, to, to share with you to others, to share the truth of who you are, to share every word that you have given us in the scriptures, that you have given us in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you in that. We thank you that they're able and healthy and, and willing to go to that new spot to share you. So there is joy, much joy. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. I invite you guys to go ahead and have a seat and hang in for just a minute more. All we really have left to do is the closing prayer. However, 
I uh, had wanted to say one more thing, kind of uh, unrelated, and it is actually a touch vain for me to bring it up, but it was something happened in this church on Father's Day 2000. Uh, that was my first Sunday to preach here. So today marks my 20 year, Stephanie and I's 20 year anniversary with this church. It's been a few days. 20 years. Sometimes I wonder, was it harder on you guys or on me? Some days I wonder, was it more of a joy for you guys or for me? It has been a wonderful ministry, a time to get to know. And, and watching, watching a church as pastor, I, I have to tell you that what you always remember and watch is, is not really the church, but individuals. I look around the room and remember people that timid, shy, came to church, got baptized, changed their life, serving, rocking the devil's kingdom, scaring him to death now because they serve the Lord. Seeing the change is where the joy is. Let's be dismissed with a final word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here and spend this time giving you glory and honor and making this church and our service and our worship together all about you. Help us as we, as we gather again in Bible studies and, and in worship next week. Help us to continue to learn more about you and to bring more people to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.